It's been over a month since Yom Kippur. But I'm noticing that time and time again, I catch myself singing aloud the words and the melodies of Kol Nidre. And whenever this happens, I stop with confusion. It doesn't seem appropriate to be singing Yom Kippur tunes after the Yamim Nora'in, after the High Holy Days. But I've realized that these last few weeks have certainly carried the heaviness, the power, the anxiety that comes with the holiest moments of our calendar. In some ways, it feels like we've all been fasting, like we've been preparing for a national cheshbon nefesh, an accounting of our collective souls. And like Yom Kippur, the hangover has left us confused, with relief for some and dissatisfaction for others. Because for years we have heard a different version of Kol Nidre, not one where vows are annulled, but one where vows and promises become dreams and expectations, where we tell ourselves that the world will be different and that at long last, true and lasting change is at our doorstep. But if we believe that Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or anyone else can single-handedly fix the wounds, both individual and communal, that lay open and bleeding across our nation and across the world, then we are destined for a disappointment that will pull us even further apart. We can all make an argument here that our country is broken, that our community is broken, that the world is broken, and that each and every one of us is broken. But our brokenness is not a cause for hopelessness and it is not a cause for despair. It's a reminder that we are human, that we are flawed, that we make mistakes, and that we are capable of doing better. But to do so, we cannot, we must not, lay the chips and the shards of our brokenness at the feet of any one individual, of any one person. If we want change, we must see our brokenness for what it is, a responsibility that belongs to all of us, to each and every single one of us and one we must defiantly refer to as beautiful. In the New York Times this past week, Leon Weiss Weisseltier, the author of Kaddish, wrote an op-ed in remembrance of his friend Leonard Cohen. And he began his article with the words Cohen wrote to Weisseltier's son, who sent him a letter asking what inspired him to write his song, Hallelujah. Cohen responded by saying, quote, I wanted to stand with those who clearly see God's holy broken world for what it is and still find the courage or the heart to praise it. You don't always get what you want. You're not always up for the challenge, but in this case, it was given to me, for which I am deeply grateful. The wake of this election should open our eyes to the harsh reality that we have walked away from the courageous praise of our broken society and have returned to our individual concerns with the false placation that somebody else will do the job. And now we are waking up to a world in disarray, a world that is angry, hurt, scared, and inexcusably lonely. And as we look around, desperate to identify who is responsible and who will come to our rescue, the praise remains unheard, the seats of responsibility vacant. It is now up to us to decide if we will return to our task or if we will leave the broken fragments of our apathy scattered about, waiting for somebody else to gather them and to put them back together. Should we be Abraham and argue for the preservation of a people based on the merits of the righteous there within, or will we allow ourselves to turn our heads to watch our own demise and to become the frozen pillar of salt forever limited to the outskirts of a city in distress? Do we say kol nidre and annul our vows? Or do we say shavua alai, I promise, I swear, and take on the promise of repairing the overwhelming number of cracks that lay before us? The choice is ours. Ultimately, the choice is ours. But the reality of our present needs, but the reality of our present needs to be understood. The vows and promises of candidates and politicians 
build walls. The vows and promises of a people who love and care for one another build bridges. As I was preparing for Berman Night this past Thursday, I stumbled upon a TED Talk by a man named Louis Schwartzberg. Schwartzberg is a photographer who, for over 30 years, has made his living by doing time-lapse nature photography. He sets up a camera in front of a flower or a budding piece of fruit or a growing vegetable, and he films it for months. And he has rolls and rolls of film that he uses for months and months at a time, all for the sake of creating a film that might last two or three minutes. In his talk, Schwartzberg says something quite simple but incredibly profound and so important for us to hear today. He says, quote, we protect what we fall in love with. I don't believe that our brokenness has come from a malevolent desire to divide or to control or from a place of malice or disdain, but that maybe we feel broken because we have forgotten how to fall in love because we have forgotten about so much goodness and joy in our lives and in the world and have chosen rather to focus on all the ways we have been hurt or we have been wronged. We have given up the protection of the us for the sake of the protection of the I. And in so doing, we have forgotten how much more meaningful it is to speak in the plural. If we truly care about one another, about ourselves and about the world in which we live, we have to be willing to fall in love. And we have to be willing to protect that love with every ounce of energy in our bones and every amount of strength that we have in our bodies. If we take on the promise to love the stranger, to sincerely love the stranger, then we will protect her because the embarrassment of her otherness is our embarrassment. Her struggle to belong and be treated with equality is our struggle. If we take on the promise to love and pursue justice, then we fight to defend the poor and nurture the sick, because their poverty is our poverty, because their sickness is our sickness. If we take on the promise to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might, then we protect to the furthest extent of our ability the splendor of God's creation and the beauty of its diversity. But what we cannot afford to do is wait for the love of someone else. To wait for somebody better or more qualified than us to love the stranger, to pursue justice, to love God, because it is the reservation to act, the hesitation to love, that turns us to salt. This Shabbat, let us uphold our vows rather than annul them. Let us renew the promises that we have made to God, to one another, and to ourselves that we will walk humbly with the Lord, pursuing justice and peace, that we may open our hearts to a Torah that intentionally speaks in the plural and that demands our participation in the work of God's constant creation. On this Shabbat, where we read about the destruction of Sodom, the raising of Gomorrah, let us not look backward like Lot's wife, forever bound to the pains and mistakes of the past, but forward to the future with the dreams of our vows guiding our way. Let us work together to assemble the ladders that guide us back into the crow's nest of vigilance and protection, that we may guard what we have fallen in love with. Because sometimes we feel broken, but we're broken together. And I am certain that together we have the heart and we have the courage to give that brokenness our praise. Shabbat Shalom.